Let's Talk Supply Chain. So welcome to the show, Ryan. Yay, great to be here finally. Yeah, right? It's been a while. I'm so excited because I get the chance to speak to you. And I've wanted to chat with you for a long time. I have so many questions. I had Will Urban on the show a whole year ago in January 2023. And a lot has changed for you. It's changed for the industry. It's changed for Flexport. And so I can't wait to dive behind the scenes with you, right? I really want to get into some of those changes, what they mean for you, for the industry, and what we can all expect from 2024, because there's a lot to come. So let's just dive right in. Now, I love to have founders on the show, and I get a real kick out of hearing those journeys. And you have to be one of the ones that everybody wants to hear about, or hear from anyways. So I want to hear about your journey from you. What was the original why behind founding and building Flexport? Um, I felt like the freight forwarding industry was very opaque um, and super important. And so, you know, George George Bernard Shaw, one of my favorite quotes, he says, every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. And it just seems like freight forwarding is just a poster child for that. And it like they sort of speak in all this code words and it's all this mystery, hard to figure out what's really happening with your freight, what the rate market rates should be, what all these different fees are, the paperwork. And it seemed to me as a small business, I was at that time, 25 years ago, running an import export business, buying uh, motorcycles overseas and selling them on the internet. And oh, really? we really had a software business. We were building e-commerce sites and inventory management systems, um, integrating with freight systems downstream for less than truckload freight to deliver the motorcycles to customers in a pretty automated huh. fashion. Uh, Try to build automated systems to interact with the customs and freight world. And it was sort of like talking to a rock, got nowhere. And- <laughs> Um, and it seemed like these companies were very profitable, good businesses, but kind of just like hard to work with. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, about 10 years later, it took me a long time before in count between when I encountered the problem and actually set out to start Flexport. Uh, but that was kind of 2008, 2009 is when I first started working on the business plan and the idea for Flexport. Um, but yeah, it was the original idea. It was sort of born out of that um, concept that, well, this is something that's super important, global trade doing business in, on the internet, being able to buy stuff anywhere in the world, sell stuff anywhere in the world. The world's, the internet's brought companies way closer together, brought people closer together. And yet somehow the movement of goods was not happening as seamlessly as the movement of data. So felt like that. When you see something that's like broken and important, it's a pretty good heat map judgment layer for you to go, go work on it. Well, and you saw that first hand. I saw that firsthand because I worked for my dad's freight forwarding company. And we didn't have a lot of technology and what we did have was very clunky and not very user friendly. So I totally get that. And that was even pre 2008. I think I even used a typewriter until, I don't know, 2015 or something like that, just to type out checks to the Steve. We Club. had an early job applicant that was like, why do you want to work here? He's like, I don't like using a typewriter at my customs broker. I was like, wow, yeah. we're going to be. This should Somebody be, this actually should be. said that? Yeah, in a job interview. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Now you brought a lot of interest and investment into the industry. And some would say you've kind of put supply chain tech on the map, kind of in a world where Excel remains still supreme, even to this day. And there's still a lot of maybe fax machines lurking, maybe even some typewriters <laughs> in some logistics officers offices. Why did you go so hard? And how did you explain logistics to the VC industry to be able to get that kind of investment? Um, well, the, the industry is relatively easy to understand at the level that an investor needs to understand it, which is it's massive. It's one of the biggest industries in the world, something like 10 to 15% of GDP, depending whose study you believe. Okay. Um, global GDP. It's just a massive industry. Yeah. It's highly fragmented and it's possible in the freight forwarding layer, at least to build a very asset light business. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you see a highly fragmented industry where the newest competitor, you know, if you look at the top hundred freight forwarders in the world by volume or revenue or whatever or profit, there's only one that was founded after the internet was invented in 94, the, the web browser, the commercial internet. Uh, and that's Flexport. There was not, it's, so you look at this like antiquated industry that's massive and it's asset light in mm -hmm. theory. Uh, it's pretty good. That's kind of enough heat map for an, and then you, 
then you show like, well, whether or not the investors want to come along, we're just putting up graphs of growth. Um, and I was the first investor in Flexport, um, funded it myself for, for the first five years. Um, uh, and so you, investors kind of at some huh. point get on the chain and say, oh, okay. Like this thing is going with or without me, I should probably invest. So. Yeah. Well, and you, so you were bootstrapping for the first five years. Yeah. I didn't realize that was part of the story. I thought you got investment right off the bat. How much have you been able to successfully get an investment? How much money have we raised? Mm -hmm. Two, a lot, $2.6 billion. Wow. That's a lot of yeah. money. And, and you've had a lot of press as well over the last couple of years, right? You've been, was it 60 minutes? You've been all over the place. I think you're on the cover of Forbes. Was that kind of your plan all along or how did all of that kind of snowball for you? No, um, you know, I don't think the press wrote anything about Flexport for our first eight or nine years. Never got even okay, fair the slightest point. bit of mention. Um, <laughs> and and I do think it's valuable. It's it's helped us get better known and and helped our sales process for the most part. I mean, there's some negative press here and there too. It's uh, but on on average on on net, it's been quite a positive force for us. Um, I do what we did do very intentionally was build a brand around thought leadership and say, Hey, the, you know, th this industry is opaque. I already said it's sort of the, that line about the, the uh, every profession being a conspiracy against the lady. And, and we found there's this wide open opportunity to do marketing as education and okay. come in and say, Hey, we can be thought leaders. We can kind of shine a flashlight into this black box of global trade and logistics mm -hmm. and freight forwarding and show you how it works. Show you where the profit pools are, argue against interest in some cases where you're saying, Hey, this is a very intransparent industry. Here's how it benefits your freight provider. Here's what you can do. We do, we, we were some of the first in this industry to do simple things like have webinars weekly or news mm -hmm. email newsletters about what's happening kind of um, to say, it, actually a lot of things that you can borrow from the travel industry that they've done s simple tools to check rates or subscribe to rates and kind of bring some transparency to the industry. We, we, we knew that if this industry is interesting enough, that if we kind of consistently put out interesting content, whether that's mm -hmm. on our blog or our webinar series or other other people's podcasts where we can appear, uh, Twitter, that we would be able to, in time, kind of build a following. And, and that um, even as it relates to journalists, like we never really have th sought to be self-promotional. I think self-promotion is basically dead now because yeah. ev anybody can go out and promote themselves and say, I'm the best. Like that's true. social media makes that free. You literally just type I'm the best and um, nobody <laughs> believes it. Nobody cares, right. but they, they are interested. If you can show them solutions to a problem, you can show them information that's thought provoking or, um, you know, useful content. And so we knew that if we kind of consistently put that out and then built relationships with journalists who were covering those themes, mm -hmm. interested in those areas, they would cover that. So Flexport, early days, we actually got quite a lot of mentions in articles, but the articles were never about Flexport. And we were fine right. with that. Like, you know, it was like, a, yeah. here's what's happening in ocean freight rates or something. And then at some point, you know, something tipped over and they started to write about us as a company. But um, but we're happy to just, you know, be seen as thought leaders and people who are helpful. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, the press doesn't really talk about supply chain until the pandemic hit. <laughs> and it was like supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. And so it was really interesting to see them sort of grasp on to how, how important supply chain is, which is what you've been talking about, right? How important it is, how important it is to GDP, how, how important it is to the economy. And so it was nice to see that they were actually, you know, putting some time and some air to it. Yeah, totally. I think All right. More coverage. Yeah. So a, lo a lot has changed for Flexport over the last year. The brand and yourself, you've been in the press. There's been some up and ups and downs, as is the way in all businesses and supply chain. So I really want to talk about those changes and sort of give our listeners more of an insight into what's going on behind the scenes, because we can all be a little bit guilty of believing the headlines, but we don't always know the full story. So talk to us about some of those big changes that have happened in the last year. Oh, well, you know, Flexport's transformed itself in the last year um, in many ways. We, we, well, we've made two major acquisitions. Um, we acquired Shopify Logistics and we acquired the assets and the IP of, of Convoy. So a mm -hmm. technology company for full truckload, as well as uh, the Shop Logistics is really a fulfillment business for um, both uh, direct-to-consumer e-commerce, parcel delivery to consumers' doors, as well as B2C. 
B2B uh, retail distribution business. So made two big acquisitions. Uh, we, we hired a CEO, I became exec chairman, and then the board decided to ask me to come back. Uh, so there was about a six month period where I was the chairman of the board and not the CEO. I've come back in and really reoriented the whole company around a handful of things. It's really about our culture of engaging with customers, our driving quality, um, in profitability, cutting costs. Uh, and so we've done a lot in that regard. We've, we've got, we're a leaner team. We're back to the size we were probably in like 2022 from a okay. headcount standpoint, we're much leaner. Um, we've got, uh, well, we've just in the last five months, since I came back to the seat, we've improved our EBIT, our earnings by over, over $600 million in the last five months. So we've been wow. without raising prices to customers, just going really hard on costs and auditing freight bills and um, making sure our invoices are accurate and running a tight ship, like freight forwarding, it's like Has people underestimate the amount of accounting that goes into freight forwarding, <laughs> but it's largely an accounting problem. It's a communications mm -hmm. and accounting problem. Um, yep. And so really tightening the screws on all of those things and, and running a tight ship. And then on the quality piece, um, you know, most of the inefficiencies and costs and logistics come from bad quality, mm -hmm. bad data, mistakes that are made, um, that will lead to way more cost than just like, oh, how many files can you do per hour or something like that? Um, <laughs> and so really dialing up the quality we found is the best way to improve costs. And I think we'd lost sight of that a little bit. So getting good quality KPIs and getting a good org structure where people can really own the KPIs for each customer. A um, lot, lot of, oh, wow. It's been a, been a crazy, crazy 12 months, probably more than most people, most companies will go through in four or five years, probably that Flexport's done. And, and, and by the way, you can draw that back four or five years and say the same about Flexport just with, between the pandemic, um, what it did to freight prices and congestion at the ports, the uh, before that. And during that time as well, the lack of air capacity and shipping masks to hospitals and the, the scramble to get PPE imported all, all over the world. Um, and it, you know, it just goes back and back into tariffs with the Trump administration, mm -hmm. putting new tariffs on our customers. It's never a, never a dull day in logistics. It's kind of why we like it though. It's high paced and it's, it's exciting. You're always learning new stuff. All about problem solving. Right. And you're right on the accounting thing. Cause I remember that being the bane of my existence and operations. Now you said that you acquired Shopify logistics. That kind of goes back to your roots where you were talking about e-commerce, right? E-commerce logistics and kind of how you got started. Why is that one important to your vision? What does it mean for Flexport? Yeah. Well, it's on a couple of levels. Um, first off, we really want to be a one-stop shop. I think you, the idea that you can all forms of freight, whether from a smallest parcel in the world up to many containers mm -hmm. on a ship uh, or full airplane loads of freight, buy it in one place, ship it anywhere in the world, uh, make that super easy by any mode, air, ocean, truck, and rail freight. Um, so we really like this all-encompassing end-to-end -end vision, be able to ship anything anywhere. Um, I, I, there's a principle in nature, it's called the, the competitive exclusion principle, which is like if, if you're able to do anything that your competitor can do uh, at, and at least as well as them, they will go extinct. Uh, that's how it, that's okay. how it works in the natural world and ecosystems, unless that competitor figures out some niche that they're able to do better than you at. Uh, and, but so we like, we don't want there to be surface areas in our platform where we can't cover. Um, and there still are, it, there will be for many years. It's like, a um, continue to expand globally into more regions, uh, bring, for example, the fulfillment business today is only in the United States. We'd love to take it more globally. Yeah. Um, so, and then, and then the ability to do things with data, because you have the downstream, you're seeing the demand, what's selling for the customers. Yeah. What, what is the movement of products out to into store networks or into people's homes now puts you in a really good place because we have a great order management product, which is how you replenish, how you place orders back to your factories. Mm -hmm. As you tie these systems together, to be the best at helping customers make decisions about replenishment, how many units to order, when to order them, how to ship them, where to position them to be ready for future demand. Um, without that, when before we bought Shopify Logistics, we were sort of just delivering to a warehouse and then calling it a day. That was, right. our, that was the end of our job. Yeah. Um, you weren't gonna get demand signals out of that. And now you start to be able to package that up and say, hey, we can make suggestions to you when to place a purchase order. Um, yeah. And then, so those were all part of the thought process for acquiring that business. Of course, partnering with Shopify is a no brainer. 
you know, it's like Canadian one company. Of the most impressive, shout out. <laughs> one of the most, yeah, Canadian, yeah, for sure. One of the most impressive companies in the world. Um, their 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 platform has three million, I believe, merchants. Not all of them are going to be sweet spot sweet spot purchasers of international freight or even fulfillment. Right. It's a lot of mom and pops have a small business on there and stuff that mm-hmm. super small business, but. But for, for all of them, you know, at some point as they grow and hit their goals should become good co- target candidates. And as it is, there's hundreds of thousands of customers there that, that should become great Flexport customers. So we think there's a great partnership that we've built a great partnership with them. Um, and then the piece that was an added bonus that was like pure upside that we didn't think about, that we should have been more on, is that it, because that business does something like 40 million parcels, we'll see, we're going to grow it a lot this year, but some somewhere around 40 million units of um Wow. parcel shipping. Uh, it's, okay. a big, it's a pretty big business. It um, We've got good rates. I would say great rates, but it depends on who you compare with. But I think we have really good rates negotiated with the last mile carriers, the the, the um, final mile mm-hmm. like delivery companies or, or across the United States. And that has now positioned us because we're a great air freight forwarder and we have customs capabilities. When you package that with the last mile, we're now becoming lead. We have become leaders in this global e-com manifest clearance, shipping things under what's called a 321 exemption for de minimis on customs, where it's, if it's less than $800, you don't pay any customs duties. And so we are, we've, we didn't, before we were able to do the air freight and the customs piece, but then someone else had to do last mile. We acquired the last mile contracts. And now, and in some cases we're using our sort centers where stuff comes in, We'll deconsolidate, resort it, ship it out, and put it injected into the last mile networks. So it's it's that acquisition added bonus made us very very compelling for people that are doing uh, fulfillment from origin from Asia directly. We haven't yet built 321 fulfillment centers in Canada and Mexico, which we get a lot of demand for. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I'm a little nervous of whether that loophole, if you want to call it a loophole, with that law survives whether it continues to exist before i put lots and lots of more investment yeah uh, to open up new sites in canada and mexico our customers badly want us to do that yeah. i'm sort of watching watching washington dc to see what happens and before i put a lot of money into capex of uh, building out new sites well i might have somebody for you to partner with but we'll talk about that after we All hit right. the stop recording button um but you're right and the de minimis on the canadian side is nothing compared to the us side uh which is a little bit crazy to me um and a little bit hard to manage but mm. i can totally see that and um i also understand the collaboration from a technology and a data standpoint because i always talk about how supply chain teams need to collaborate with marketing they need to collaborate with customer experience and customer service just to be able to get some of that data and what you're talking about is how important it is to bring all of that data, all of those movement movements together from a technology standpoint so that you can really understand and be predictive in your supply chains, which is what supply chains teams need right now. Yeah. And, and building it, you know, for all the different stakeholders in a company that there's people that supply chain data is useful outside of supply chain teams. Oh yeah. Um, like your sales and marketing team wants to know when this stuff going to arrive for their campaigns mm-hmm. and, and their launches and things. And and they really need to know, right. If there's a big launch and marketing budget tied. To, well, tied when to peak it. is um, like, let's not order stuff around peak guys. You know, if you really need it to turn around really quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then um, your, your accounts payable team really needs this data too. Like your people that are paying the bills, if you're going to pay a, an invoice to a factory, you're paying for the goods for your purchase orders the payment terms are always explicitly tied to when the goods were either picked up or delivered based on the income terms, based on the terms of that shipment. And that accounts payables team that's paying an invoice that they've received from a factory is, is having to go to the supply chain team and get dates and information about hey, when did this thing, should I pay this or not? And so being able to onboard these different stakeholders from across the company onto the platform, let them see that data themselves. And yeah, they can ask questions inside the app but often they can just find the information themselves and not need to ask a question. Right. Um, and so, you know, we're, we have users with hundreds, we have uh, empl- uh, customers with hundreds of users, hundreds of employees that they onboard to collaborate. Right. Um, and then also onboarding each of their factories, the average U S company that comes on board will onboard 18 suppliers overseas. Uh, and they communicate fundamentally, you know, supply chains is a data problem. It's like you need the data okay. to flow in parallel to the goods. Um, that's mm-hmm. true for compliance purposes, for communication, just being able to know when stuff is going to arrive, how to make decisions downstream, finances, I've said, 
um, probably lots of every business model is unique. So tons of other use cases. Absolutely. Now I want to go back to what you said about having a leaner team right now, because unfortunately uh, layoffs are part of that change, but we've seen that across many organizations, not just supply chain, but technology, other industries. Why do you think certain people in the industry came for you so hard when you were by no means the only organization that had to make some of these incredibly tough decisions? Oh, I, to be honest, I didn't notice if they were coming at me hard. I think well, I'll, probably the answer is uh, is envy, one of those fundamental human emotions mm. that we've managed. We it, it's take the good with the bad. Like the press celebrates us when we're doing well and makes us famous and and puts me on sixty minutes in the cover of Forbes. And then uh, when things aren't going so well, it's like human nature is to <laughs> oh, attack and, and go after it. Uh, right. I don't I don't let that. I don't think that matters to us at all. It's like we have to we have to run a tight ship. Um, Frankly, we deserve criticism. Like we we hired too many people and then we let people go. It's embarrassing and 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 bad for our company and our culture. And uh, we've tried to do everything we can to make sure it's not bad for our customers. We we reduced the size of our tech team quite a bit. We reduced the size of our core corporate overhead, fixed costs, accounting, and finance and HR teams, especially on the HR side. Um, but uh, we didn't cut the teams that are doing sales and operations because those are the people making sure the customers have a great experience. Right. And even on tech, like, yeah, we reduced the size of our tech team. I still think we have the, the most and best engineers of any freight forwarding company out there. And we're still going to be the leaders in supply chain tech. So it doesn't, you know, it's a little, it is sad because it'll take us longer to build our roadmap. Um, we have a pretty exciting road, uh, roadmap, or exciting mm -hmm. list of things that we're going to go build for our customers. And, you know, now instead of doing it all in 18 months, it'll right. be a few years of building, but that's, yeah. that's fine. It, you know, we're, we're going to be patient and persistent. So. Well, and I appreciate you sharing that because I think it's a, it's on a lot of people's minds right now. And I want to make sure that we, we address that, but I do understand. I mean, listen, my dad was a business owner. There are tough decisions and things that need to be made to be able to keep things going and keep things um, happening and moving and creating that innovation. And so can you talk to us a little bit about the market right now? Because you bought Convoy, right? You bought the assets from Convoy. Talk to us about why you did that when the market is so volatile on the trucking side. Oh, um, well, Convoy built the best the best technology for truckload, like full stop. They just had the best full truckload technology out there. Um, and as assessed by not just my own opinion as now the owner of that technology, but you can ask even people from Uber Freight and others will tell you if they're being honest that Convoy was the leader in technology. Um, mm -hmm. And so we saw there was a distressed asset. We bought it out of bankruptcy. We just bought the technology and the IP, not the, not the underlying business um, or the entities or legal entities. But uh, the technology is incredible. And, and one, Flexport had a, has a full truckload business of customers buying full truckload. Um, We've gone back to many of the customers that were buying truckload through Convoy's tech and brought some of the biggest ones back and, and having productive conversations with with most of the mm -hmm. customers. Uh, it, it's a massive, massive market. And to be the leaders in technology in a massive market at a, at a really reasonable price, it was kind of a no-brainer investment. The timing wasn't great for us because we're going through our own transformations and right. needing to cut costs and run leaner. But hey, you don't, you know, we don't live in a perfect world where things show up exactly when you want them to. Well, and to be honest with you, if you've already got that truckload customer, you want to be able to provide them with the best service and the best technology. And it just honestly seems like a bit of a no-brainer. So yeah, and, and the tech specifically, what it does is it allows you to tap, it allows us to tap into this long tail of owner operators. We have about four hundred thousand drivers on the mobile app. And they're all with small owner operators, mm -hmm. uh, about 65,000 carriers. So it's an average of about, what is that? Five, six, five, five and a half or so um, trucks per, per carrier. So it's long tail, a lot of individual owner operators too. Right. Um, and it's, it's amazing capacity because these are entrepreneurs who are really dedicated and care a lot about their business. They're running things. They're running a tight ship. Um, their on-time performance is better than others. Their reliability, their security is better they're, you know, but they're, um, but they're very expensive to work with for a traditional broker, right? Because the only way to reach them is through a load board, typically, because mm -hmm. you know you're not going to call a small carrier because you have a load. What are the odds that that guy with five trucks has got one of them right. available for you and your load? It's like vanishingly small. <laughs> I used to small. think that when I was using LoadLink when I was in trucking, I was like, what are the odds and how many phone calls do I need to make to make this happen? 
<laughs> yeah, and so you they, they either have to work with mid-sized carriers or post things to load boards, and we know those load boards are just full of fraud. Mm -hmm. um, and and convoys built. So one is the ability through tech to access that capacity, and then through tech to vet the capacity. It runs before every single load. It, mm -hmm. it runs and reruns six different background checks on hmm. them. If the driver the driver has to have the mobile app on throughout the journey, uh, leads to great visibility and data, but also great security because if they veer off the expected route. Right. It sends us. It sends a message to security and says, "Hey, this is a potential huh. fraud risk here." Uh, wow. So, lot of, like, I was actually surprised because I'm not a truckload expert. We're an international yeah, yeah. freight company, freight Flexport. But um, when I started to dig in on the product and technology of Convoy, I was kind of my first reaction was like, "Wow, you got? Why did you spend so much time on fraud detection?" Uh, right. I hadn't spent enough time in the deal, industry, though. obviously, to realize, yeah. like, "Oh, okay, it's like a huge competitive differentiator." Uh, and then that long tail of high quality capacity tends to be lower cost. You're cutting out these layers of bureaucracy and middlemen that come through bigger companies. Mm -hmm. uh, tends to be higher quality because mm -hmm. you know owner on operator entrepreneurs are closer to the business. They care more. They're more dialed in. And so yeah. to solve just you know, the only problem we have to solve is cutting out the in, in, the inefficiency of finding that capacity. And that's what the tech yeah. does. So well, and it gives asset. you gives you access to work with so many more and new businesses, even small and medium sized businesses to help support that community too. Well, so interestingly, yeah, yeah. interestingly uh, on the supply side, yeah, small, small, medium sized businesses, the demand side for Convoy traditionally was large enterprise, uh, like mm -hmm. the biggest companies in the world. Um, and that's kind of interesting because Flexport is much more like mid market type companies, okay. SMBs in mid market, mm -hmm. uh, but that's fine. That's actually good for us. But Convoy's not selling full truckload anymore. Flexport is, uh, right. and Convoy's just the supply side brand and the supply side technology platform and network. And that's a really important distinction because what we're doing is bringing other brokers on to allow them to tap into that capacity. Okay. The reality is it's such a great supply side network of carriers, like 400,000 drivers and, and it's going to wow. grow a lot. Um, we as Flexport, or even if it's just Convoy as a standalone, would not be able to send enough full truckload volume to keep all those drivers fed that's and true. happy and excited. Yeah. So it's actually, um, the network is worth more than more volume that flows through it. It's worth more to those drivers. It'll attract more drivers to the platform. So we're opening it back up. Uh, Convoy had this thing, Convoy for Brokers, which was one of its fastest growing, most popular, best products. We're going to relaunch that. We're targeting April to bring it back hmm. online so other brokers can tap into that long tail capacity. And it's basically what it is, is an integration with the TMS of these brokerages that'll auto, it's effectively a long tail carrier sales group. And if it can fill your load, at a lower price point than you're expecting to get, it'll just automatically do that. So you go to sleep at night and this thing's finding you, uh, covering your loads for you at a lower rate than you can do. So we're wow. going to bring that back online. I think um, that, and that's really important strategically because you want to get enough volume flowing through this thing that the supply side, these drivers are just excited and want yeah. to make it the first app they open up every day in the morning. Yeah, you want to keep them motivated so they stick around, they do a good job and their on-time delivery rate stays up there. So let's talk about what we can expect from the industry in 2024. What do you think? I mean, more disruption, that's for sure. The ongoing issues in the Red Sea, you know, you've also got uh, Panama Canal still. They're creating a lot of chatter. What are you seeing and how is it impacting business? not only for Flexport, but also your customers. Yeah, it's, um, well, the, the Red Sea, it looks like it's here to stay that the ships are going to route around the Red Sea. I don't have any prediction about that. If I, if I did, it would be like, yeah, it's going to Come on, get your crystal ball out. I want to hold you accountable in November. That's no, fine. I, 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 but, you know, I'll <laughs> say I've, I, I'll make a prediction, but then I'll have to caveat it by like most of my predictions have been wrong. So, uh, can, <laughs> all right, uh, fair. <laughs> as, along with everybody else, like it's, it tends to be better just to be ready for whatever happens. Um, but I do think it's going to last for several years. That'd be my prediction that we continue okay. to go around. Uh, short of uh, rapid resolution in Israel and Gaza, then I don't see the Yemeni uh, Houthis um, stopping this. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any appetite for a US ground invasion of Yemen, which is what it would take to stop it without them wanting to stop on their own. Right. So I just don't see that happening. Again, I'm no geo geopolitical expert. Um, the, that's, the, that's the bad news, that supply chains will run slower as a result. It takes, uh, you know, it, it takes a few weeks longer to go around than to go through the Suez. That um, the good news for the customers is I don't think it's gonna have a lasting impact on price for ocean freight. Okay. We're already starting to see chatter of freight rates for this RFP season, which is coming up where companies are gonna go sign their annual contracts 
going to be back in line, maybe a little higher than last year, but last year was historically pretty low. low. Yeah. Um, and so I, and the reason for that is that there's just a lot of excess capacity coming mm -hmm. online um, and the carriers know it. There's not an increase in demand. We're not like in the COVID times when demand was up 20% and the right. congestion was effectively reducing capacity at the same time you had a perfect storm. Right now you've got supply reduced by the longer journey, but new ships have been ordered uh, years mm -hmm. ago because of the pandemic. They made a lot of money. Carriers have reinvested in their fleets. So that I, I don't see it really heavily impacting price. Um, and the customers can get used to a longer transit time as long as it's consistent and they know what to expect. Uh, it's, it's not the end of the world for them once once they settle into the new normal. Yeah. Um, Panama, yeah, same kind of story. I mean, it's going to be broken for a while. People will adapt to it. The other big one on people's this needs to be on people's radars is the ILA, which is the East Coast uh, Union or Longshore Longshoremen's Union uh, mm -hmm. for the East Coast of the United States and Canada. Is uh, their contract is up for renegotiation? I want to say in September it ends. I don't know why um, they just don't do it at the same time, the West Coast and the East Coast. Because then yeah, it would well, save a lot of people some trouble. Different unions, probably on purpose. I think the the East Coast then looks at the West Coast contract and says that it's not good enough for us, and they want better terms. Um, so strategically, so we'll got it. At least for them, it's better. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not I'm not privy to the inside gossip of how those organizations get structured the way they do, but but uh, but yeah, that's something to be on people's radar. So between Panama Canal and threats of a port strike, I think you're going to see more people wanting to move cargo into the West Coast um, mm -hmm. and have a little bit more peace of mind around around the ability to get stuff moved which will probably increase rail and truck demand um the so yeah those are some of the things that we can predict that are going to happen um, any any other challenges you think that folks should really be more medium term is really about carbon regulations and what it means for ships um mm. that a lot of the ships are not going to be compliant and so i said that the capacity is increasing and that's on aggregate true but these big, sh these big new ships, you know, a lot of the old small ships are way less efficient from a carbon and fuel economy and, and just overall price, average price per container standpoint. Um, and the owners of those fleets, the ones that are not owned by major carriers, but maybe are leased to them or run by some smaller carriers, they just don't have the, the budgets, the CapEx to go renew their fleet the same way as right. the biggest guys do. So there's be a lot of pressure on smaller carriers, on less well-funded kind of mom and pop, the Greek, the Greek ship owners, the Norwegians, the smaller mm -hmm. ones, um, to be able to keep up to speed on the carbon mandates. And it's also going to put pressure on a lot of um, smaller trades like the Asia, um, the Oceania trades. A lot of these islands, like it doesn't make sense to send a 20,000 TEU right. vessel to Fiji. Yeah. There's not enough demand sure. there. Um, but your carbon requirements are making the small vessels that currently call on a country like Fiji no mm. longer viable. They're not going to be allowed. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out in the years to come because you make these rules about carbon, about uh, they sound good when you're in The Hague or whatever, and you're mm -hmm. having a meeting in Brussels and like we're all on the same page, right? Even the island nations, they're the ones calling for these efficient, these rules because they're right. going to be very affected by climate change. But next thing you know, you've banned container shipping to Fiji and now your coastal elites can't get their Fiji water and it just blows up in their face and they're going to be really pissed off. So it's going to be interesting to watch how this plays out in the years to come. Uh, but something, yeah, something to monitor is like second order effects that aren't affect, aren't accept, uh, expected mm -hmm. from from carbon regs. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And especially if uh, container ships can't stop in a place like Fiji, what does that happen to the island and the people who are living there and the people who go and visit, right? Costs are already on the rise. It's just going to go up and up and up and up because they're not going to really yeah, be able I to mean, get... Capitalism find a way that will be an incentive and people with natural gas ships and the carriers are going to look at this as an opportunity and find ways. But, but you may find short-term pain, you know, and if you go a couple of months or a year without a container shipping service... Yeah. Uh, it's devastating for the economy. You know, yeah. locals can't get stuff. I mean, look at Hawaii right now because of the Jones Act. They have to pay like fourteen thousand bucks to get a container from the West Coast, whereas you can ship a container to China for five hundred. Right. Sales right. You know, it's going yeah, twice yeah, yeah. as far. It's crazy. Um, and uh, it makes things in Hawaii more expensive. The people of Hawaii suffer mm -hmm. from from that uh, regulation, and that that that's going to be true writ large across uh, across a lot of a lot of trades where these big, more efficient, more modern ships aren't 
there aren't going to be there for a while. And, um, and then that's, you've got natural gas shipping, you got some other kind of other text, but it's a lot more expensive. When I, when I talk to carriers about the natural gas and the cost of it per, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to look at it per liter or whatever metric. It's really about per container moved. Right. That's what people care about. What's the cost? Yeah. It's, it's going to be five to eight times more expensive um, to ship a container with natural gas yeah. or hydrogen or whatever else. <clears throat> so there's a real cost to these things. Um, yeah. It's going to translate into poverty. Yeah. People well, around the world and who, uh, stuff costs more. And yeah. You know, I remember being at the Hapag Lloyd annual general meeting. I was the MC for that one. And I was running a panel discussion. It was kind of like, who's going to pay for these additional costs? And the freight forwarder's like, well, we're not going to pay for it. And the shippers on the panel were like, we're not going to pay for it. And the steamship lines are kind of like, well, you know, why do we have to float all the costs for this? It's going to come down the line in the container pricing. So um, everybody's talking about AI, right? I kind of hear when we were at Manifest, I don't know about you, but I heard sort of AI, 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 everybody's talking about it. The conversations I'm having are really hit and miss. And I think part of the problem is that people have been working kind of backwards, trying to find a way to integrate AI into their business instead of thinking about what problems they need to solve and then figuring out how AI could help. But I think you're getting some really good results. Can you talk to us about how you're using, a, using AI and what does that look like? Yeah, well, what we're finding is that when we break problems down into small bite-sized chunks, that the AI can solve the problem. Uh, and so specifically what that looks like is like, you're, ta you're talking about moving a container from, from Vietnam to St. Louis. And if you just ask the AI, hey, ship this container from Vietnam to St. Louis, it would hallucinate some, you know, give you a few paragraphs of nonsense. It wouldn't give you anything useful. It wouldn't do anything right. useful. But when you say, hey, take um, this ocean freight contract, which is an Excel file with 20,000 rows and 14 tabs and all these if then statements for subject to charges and put it in this database, in this schema, in this format, uh, it can do that. And when you, t you know, you say, okay, check this carrier website for the latest status of this container number and then put it in the database in this location, it can do that. So by chunking the, by we spent the last decade taking the act of shipping a container, breaking it into a simple workflow. Um, and each screen, like a shipping a container across, I think it's like 146 tasks in our workflow system. And each one has custom screens that need to be completed right. uh, by an operator. And it turns out now the AI can do that. So just in the last three months, we've done we've taken six of those and turned them over to AI. And it's AI is successfully completing it somewhere between 50 and 90% of the time, depending on the task. Um, wow. And so that the human operator doesn't even see the task unless the AI fails. And some of that is like modern uh, open AI or adept AI or a few of these other kind of um, large language model technology companies. Some of it is like just machine learning models that mm -hmm. have been around for a long time. Some of it, frankly, is classic automation. It's just, okay, right. you know, let me rig this up with a software engineer. So um but I don't personally, as a CEO, as a business owner, I don't care. I just want to automate the tasks. And right. what we're finding, though, is that we've spent a decade structuring that work, and it's now set us up to be able to generate results and drive uh, drive costs down because it, of the uh, because of the decade that we spent structuring the work. It took you a decade. Well, we've been doing Flexport for a decade. Yeah, no, I mean, no, no. I, under, a lot of I understand that. But for people listening and thinking about how can I use AI to really help with some of the processes and things like that, talking about it taking a decade to really break everything down to a point where you can use it—that's a long time. Well, I'm sure you can get you know you can get benefit. For example, the ocean freight contract, you can just try this at home, take an Excel file from your I mean, that's carrier true. and feed it to <laughs> OpenAI, and then have right. it output into a JSON. Yeah, yeah. CSV file that you can upload into whatever database you're using. Um, the uh, so you can you know you can certainly do things um, quickly with it. The the but the the overall the building of a structured workflow engine that's not a trivial problem. We've we you know we yeah. spend uh, close to 100 million dollars a year on technology development. Most companies, most freight forwarders will use third party software. We think this is going to give us an advantage because if you're using the big ones are like CargoWise or Descartes or there's there's many um, good. These are great companies, but at the end of the day, you as the customer are not in control. You don't own your code base. You're not gonna be able to go in there and apply AI in the right place. And it's kind of hard for them to do it because they're automating processes hmm. for the customer's customer. Right. They may not 
do it right. Like you, you kind of being in the flow of things, iterating, doing it in a small way. Like I told you, it'll, it'll get it right for 90% of the time. The other 10%, what happens then? Yeah. You've got to have rollovers to it goes to an operator. So a lot of it's like that it's, I, maybe I'm just selling my own book, but it, it's feeling like, hey, the thesis of building tech and being a freight forwarder in one place is actually going to really benefit us here in this next next phase of AI, being yeah. able to implement it, being able to put it to work. But uh, but of course, I would have to say that because that's that is the nature of our company. But it feels good <laughs> right now. Um, and and I, you know, if you if you talk to me a few years ago, I'd be like, oh, it's really hard to automate stuff. Or we're focused more on the customer experience. Like we haven't gained that much from automation. Mm -hmm. And just over the last few months, in part because really we started in earnest building, rebuilding that workflow engine about three years ago is mm -hmm. when we totally kicked off. As, like, you know what? Forget the current engine, that we, current system that we used. Let's start from scratch rebuilding it. Right. And we launched that in July of 2023 to our operators. Mm -hmm. uh, and we keep incrementally deploying it for more use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's a big part of what set us up for this. So yeah, 10 years now, more like three actually. More like three, okay. <laughs> I was like, we have just completely overwhelmed the industry from an AI standpoint, thinking that we would it would take 10, 10 years. But at the end of the day, even three years is a long time. And I think we, we do need to talk about expectations around technology and new technology and automation and AI. And the fact that it's really only taking one problem and sort of solving different things. There's multiple different challenges that we have in supply chain that I don't even think we've touched yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the AI one is super promising and I couldn't have told you that a year or two ago. So what are you excited about AI and what are you going to use use it for next? Can you tell me? Um, I think, uh, well, it's it's really about automating the rest of those tasks is the most exciting thing for us. It's not okay. that sexy or like, it's not, the customers hopefully don't even notice it should, other than just our costs going down, our prices being cheaper. And if you, right. but if you can do it, you know, something like, if you look at the P&L of a freight forwarder, mm -hmm. about 20% of the revenue, what they charge to the customer is, Gets they get to keep twenty to thirty percent depending on how good of a forwarder it is, right. and within that twenty, call it half of that is going to labor, of the coordination of freight. Yeah, sure is. And so if you take that away, even if you took half of it away, mm -hmm. five percent cheaper than everybody else, mm -hmm. you're going to win most of the business if you're five percent cheaper in this yeah. industry. Uh, give you and a so. And if you can be better and cheaper, like, wow, this is a pretty big industry to be better and cheaper. So that's that's exciting enough for us. I think um, there'll be a lot of other use cases that that will come up. Like I mentioned earlier, be able to suggest to people the purchase order, when to place a purchase order. That's going to be a machine learning model. Um, we already okay. have machine learning models. It's not an, um, it's just using, um, it's using a, a machine learning model that's been around for a number of years, but we're using, machine learning to decide which contract to put a carrier, uh, put a container on, which sailing. Okay. Um, and that saved us 2% of our costs Okay. while wow. improving transit times because it's finding a faster sailing. And yeah. it, it's really about replanning. Like any, we get um, on average right now, we get about 1600 containers that have a change to their cargo ready date. Mm -hmm. They get canceled basically or rescheduled right. from the from the customer side because that's just the nature of supply chain. Like manufacturing is uncertain. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. that's always shifting. What would happen before is we'd end up having to cancel the booking with the carrier. And now what happens is we find another customer's carry a container and pull it forward oh. and, and, and put Got it onto it. that slot. So we're improving transit times and finding cheaper costs. This, this engine is just looking for the cheapest con uh, contract that can mm. meet the customer's transit time. So and you that's can do it learning. fast enough because like uh, going back to my freight forwarding days where everything was manual, you know, that yeah. wasn't something that we would have been able to do necessarily fast enough. It was, if it was too close to the closing day. Yeah. So we replan every single container in our entire network six, uh, 10 times a day. Hmm. So, we're, you know, hundreds of thousands of containers a year yeah, yeah. that, and that we're replanning them 10 times a day to look, is there a faster, cheaper way right now for this container? And Carriers you would never do it 10 that. times a day for these containers well we don't we don't the carrier doesn't notice um because okay. most of the time we don't actually change the thing mm -hmm. but if we are it's to fill what would have been a cancellation we're right. saying hey did someone else cancel yeah. so actually the carriers do love it because we've reduced yeah. our cancellation rate for the carriers um huh. and so and that tech right now is just for our own freight mm -hmm. on our own contracts 
we are launching it, I think, well, for this year, I think we're going to be ready in mid-March uh, to start talking about, you know, start advertising it, but I can preview now. We're going to be launching it for our BCO contract management customers. So if you're using Flexport to manage your contracts that you sign directly with carriers, mm-hmm. we're going to make this machine learning model available to you. So instead of using a simple routing guide, that's kind of, well, simple, basic, that just says, okay, ship this container on this carrier on this contract based right. on these very basic rules. It'll turn it over and let our machine learning find mm-hmm. the best contract. You, you know, you're signing contracts with five or six or more carriers, let our machine learning choose which one to use on a given right. day to hit the transit time that you want. And that that's built off of, a, again, a decade of work building sailing schedules, databases, right. integrations <laughs> with the carriers, mm-hmm. models to figure out the cheapest, uh, the way the the, mo- the predictability, the reliability, the cost, yeah. having all the data sets that we built for ourselves, mm-hmm. and now kind of opening that up for customers. Wow, that's going to bring a lot of value to them, especially if they were doing it manually. Because again, I remember what that looks like, and that's that's really going to change the day to day for a lot of supply chain teams at that enterprise level. So you're back in the role of CEO, and I'm expecting to see a few things from you. I know that you've already said that you are launching at least two things throughout this conversation in March and April. So talk mm-hmm. to us um, about April and beyond. What does 2024 look like? What's your shorter term focus? I mean, you've kind of given us that with the March April launches. What's your long longer term vision, what can customers in the industry expect from you? Yeah, well, you know, our big focus right now is is on culture of engaging with customers like every day and starting with the top, like making sure I'm leading from the front and other leaders here meeting with customers nonstop. And everybody at Flexport is focused on solving problems for customers. Number one thing is culture. Two is on quality. And we are gotten pretty good, like throughout Flexport's lifetime, if we were we're, we've been pretty good. Like we say, this is the metric and we're good at measuring it. It tends to go up and to the right. Uh, right. And over the last six months, we've gotten pretty dialed around what the quality KPIs that our customers care about are uh, and getting ownership of those metrics into, into the hands of specific operators. Um, and so honestly, a lot of what you, what we're focused on is not that exciting unless you're a Flexport customer and then it's music to your ears to be like on time performance, accuracy of our invoices, accuracy of our schedule data and our milestone data for where stuff is and when it's going to arrive, like cost, getting costs down. Um, These are, you know, it's kind of just running a high quality freight forwarding operation in the core. That's the most important thing for us. Growth, growth doesn't come from wanting growth or growing more salespeople, sending more emails, making more phone calls. It comes from like having higher quality. That's our core belief. And that people once, you know, you'll get more and more volume from your existing base. We think we only have about 10% of the volume across all of our 5,000 customers. Uh, okay. we, we think we can get a lot more volume from customers. A lot of people kicking tires, testing us out, using us for one trade lane, one right. division, et cetera. So it, we, we've seen historically like that co- those cohorts of customers just grow and grow with us. So getting focused on quality. And then over the medium term, it's really about integrating these three different business units from the full truck load, last mile fulfillment stuff, and yep. Flexport core forwarding. The, the 321 manifest product is the first one that really integrates a few of these things uh, mm-hmm. where you're tying that last mile delivery plus customs and air freight. But um, do more and more on the user experience side to say, hey, there's actually one, even though we've acquired these companies, it should feel like one product for the customer. Right. Right. So doing that integration and make sure making sure that everybody is working together for that customer experience. You have been all about the customer, I think, since the very beginning. It's something that you talk about a lot. Um, so I can't wait to see what more happens for you in 2024. So in a landscape of globalization, we're all more connected than ever before. And yet our ability to ship, store and trade goods has remained alarmingly fragmented. It takes up to 20 companies to move one shipment, each with its own systems and processes. Flexport's platform simplifies global trade by connecting everyone in the supply chain. The first platform to connect the entire ecosystem 
ecosystem of global trade, Flexport is setting a new standard for global trade and empowering buyers, sellers, and logistics providers of all sizes to grow and innovate together. If you want to find out more, you can check them out at Flexport.com. A massive thanks to your team over at Flexport for making this happen. And Ryan, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. It's been great to, great to be with you today.